Lecture 6, The Peoria Speech, 1854. In our last lecture, we explored the complex changes in American politics during the 1850s, particularly the Compromise of 1850, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, and the Lecompton Constitution controversy. Out of all of those, the one that was the most pivotal was the Kansas-Nebraska Act. One of its effects that we did not mention last time was that it significantly destabilized both of the major political parties the Democrats, and the Whigs. This was less apparent for the Democrats than it was for the Whigs because both Northern and Southern Democrats committed themselves to the principle of popular sovereignty as embodied in the Act. They interpreted the principle in two very different ways. Northern Democrats said the territory can vote to keep slavery out right away. Southern Democrats said it's only when it comes in as a state that it can decide to keep slavery out. And of course, if slavery has been permitted while it's a territory, it would never make that decision. But for the time being, the Democrats papered over this difference with a common commitment to popular sovereignty. The Whigs came apart. And indeed, the Whig party would die over the question of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Southern Whigs divided themselves between those who joined up with the Southern Democrats in order to extend slavery, and those who joined the newly emerging Know-Nothing Party, which was concerned with limiting immigration. Northern Whigs divided into those who were anti-Nebraska, that is, who were pledged to try to repeal the Kansas-Nebraska Act, and those who would let it go, and there weren't many of the latter. So the Whig Party effectively fragmented between North and South. This all became clear after the midterm elections of 1854. But during that election campaign, politics were in flux. And Lincoln came back to the public forum to speak out in the 1854 campaign in favor of Illinois candidates who were anti-Nebraska Whigs. In the process, he explicated his own political philosophy rather clearly in speeches delivered during that campaign. He gave a speech in September in Springfield at the Illinois State Fair that he substantially repeated six weeks later in Peoria and that has come to be known as the Peoria speech. One of the things that's interesting about this speech, by the way, is that Stephen Douglas had spoken in Peoria that afternoon, went on for about three hours. At the end of his speech, people clamored for Lincoln to come up and reply. So this speech was really given in reply to Senator Douglas. But Lincoln said, folks, it's already after 5 o'clock. Douglas has been talking for over three hours. I'll probably go on for as long. And anybody that can stay and hear me can get some supper and come back later. So folks, please come back at 7 o'clock, which the audience agreed to do. And then Lincoln delivered a rather lengthy speech. In print, it runs over 40 pages. And so what I would like to do in talking about the Peoria speech is not to summarize it in the order in which Lincoln spoke, because there's large segments of it that are relatively incidental to our purposes, but to jump around in the speech and try to illustrate how in the Peoria speech Lincoln begins to work out his middle ground position on slavery and to do so with a consciousness of the rhetorical constraints under which he operates. So the very first thing that Lincoln does to explain himself is to make a distinction. We will find Lincoln making many distinctions in these next few years, but this one is the most basic. It's a distinction between the existing institution of slavery and its extension into the territories. This is the distinction that he'll use to combat the claim that he's an abolitionist. So early on in the speech, he says, I wish to make and to keep the distinction between the existing institution and the extension of it so broad and so clear that no honest man can misunderstand me and no dishonest one successfully misrepresent me. So he's going to focus not on the existing institution, 
but on its extension. And we see here right off Lincoln beginning to make some strategic distinctions that he'll use to create his middle ground. In this speech, he refutes the arguments that support popular sovereignty, the arguments that Douglas would so frequently use. Lincoln denied Douglas's claim that it was actually the founding fathers who initiated popular sovereignty, and he referred, in fact, to Thomas Jefferson. He said, with the author of the Declaration of Independence, the policy of prohibiting slavery in new territory originated, because Jefferson had favored keeping slavery out of the Northwest Territory, the area that became Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin. So as Lincoln says with a note of sarcasm that I think we can easily catch, thus, away back of the Constitution, in the pure, fresh, free breath of the Revolution, the state of Virginia and the National Congress put that policy into practice. And then he says, referring to Douglas, but now new light breaks upon us. Now Congress declares this ought never to have been, and the like of it must never be again referring, of course, to the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And in a pointed reference to Douglas, he says, we even find some men who drew their first breath and every other breath of their lives under this very restriction, the Northwest Territory restriction, <clears throat> now live in dread of absolute suffocation if they should be restricted in the sacred right of taking slaves to Nebraska. A sacred right, of course, that Jefferson and the founders never thought of, their own father never thought of, they never thought of themselves a year ago. Referring, of course, to the fact that Douglas in 1853 had not come up with this idea. Douglas had defended popular sovereignty by appeal to what he called the sacred right of self-government. Lincoln was not about to be caught in this trap. He supported the sacred right of self-government, but he denied that it had any application to the case at hand. Another interesting distinction we see Lincoln making. He said, the doctrine of self-government is right, absolutely and eternally right, but it has no just application as here attempted. Why? He says, if the Negro is a man, it is a total destruction of self-government to say that he too shall not govern himself. When the white man governs himself, that is self-government. But when he governs himself and also governs another man, that is more than self-government. That is despotism. So he's not going to be taken in by Douglas's attempt to ground popular sovereignty in the sacred right of self-government. He then proceeds, as he does several times in this speech, to take Douglas's argument to its logical conclusion. This is a rhetorical technique called reductio ad absurdum reducing the argument to absurdity. That if you take it out to its logical limits, you get an absurd result, and that fact tells you you ought to reject the argument in the first place. Well, here's his reductio ad absurdum. He says, if popular sovereignty is the rule, then you must leave it to each individual to say for himself whether he will have slaves. What better moral right have 31 citizens of Nebraska to say that the 32nd shall not hold slaves than the people of 31 states have to say that slavery shall not go into the 32nd state. In other words, if you really believe in self-government, you can't stop at the level of the state or the territory or the community. You have to extend it so that each person governs himself, and that, of course, is anarchy. So having seen that that's where popular sovereignty logically leads, Lincoln concludes we ought to reject popular sovereignty. Now, one of the things that Douglas had said was that the question of slavery in the territories was the business of the people who went there and not his own business. He basically said, look, this is a complex moral question. Let the people who are going to live with it decide it. If slavery is a blessing, let it be their blessing. If it's a curse, let the curse be on them. Lincoln denied that the issue was of relevance only to the people who went there to live and argued it was, in fact, relevant to the whole country. Listen why, because you'll see something interesting about Lincoln's view at this point on the state of race relations. 
He says, whether slavery shall go into Nebraska or other new territories is not a matter of exclusive concern to the people who may go there. The whole nation is interested that the best use shall be made of these territories. We want them for the homes of free white people. This they cannot be if slavery shall be planted within them. In other words, you see, what Lincoln is saying is his concern that slavery be kept out of the territories is not primarily a concern for the status of the slave. It's a concern for the status of the territory. He wants them to be places where free whites can go, and they won't go there if slavery goes in. But that's why he argues that Douglas is wrong in saying this is an issue of exclusive concern to the people who go there to live. On the other hand, Lincoln is deferential to the people of the South. He does not attack them. He does not attack their institution. He goes out of his way to say that he has no quarrel with the Southern people. He says, let me say, I think I have no prejudice against the Southern people. They are just what we would be in their situation. If slavery did not now exist amongst them, they would not introduce it. If it did now exist amongst us, we would not instantly give it up. So he acknowledges that this is not a particularly southern issue or southern fault. In fact, he goes beyond that to recognize explicitly the constitutional rights of the southerners, making clear his distinction between the existing institution and its extension. He says, when they remind us of their constitutional rights, I acknowledge them, not grudgingly, but fully and fairly. And he acknowledges their right, including the right to have fugitive slaves return to their masters. And finally, in talking about the southern people, he acknowledges that he himself has no idea what to do about the existing institution of slavery. He says, if all earthly power were given me, I should not know what to do as to the existing institution. And he proceeds to eliminate all the alternatives. Keep them as slaves, free them but make them our underlings, free them and send them away, free them and keep them among us. And says he can't imagine any of these things working out. So he's quite prepared to acknowledge the difficulty and the complexity of the problem and to respect all the southern rights. But having said all of that, he returns to his distinction between tolerating slavery where it already exists and extending it into new territories where it does not. Lincoln, in this speech, reveals, although not all in one place, his basic moral position. He hates slavery. He hates it. And he says he hates it not only not only because it deprives our Republican example of its just influence in the world, and also because of the monstrous influ injustice of, of slavery itself, but also because it enables the enemies of freedom to taunt us as hypocrites, saying we really do not support freedom when it comes to our slaves. So he expresses his own hatred of slavery, and he objects to the position that it is not a moral question. He says, I object to it because it assumes that there can be moral right in the enslaving of one man by another. And he insists that fundamentally that is morally wrong. Now, Douglas, in claiming that it's okay to permit slavery to spread if the people want it, is portrayed by Lincoln as a man of moral indifference. This is a charge that Lincoln is going to embellish in the coming years, but he introduces it here in Peoria. Referring to Douglas, he says, In the remark of the judge, there is a significance which I think is the key to the great mistake he has made in the Nebraska measure. The judge has no very vivid impression that the Negro is a human, and consequently has no idea that there can be any moral question in legislating about him. For Douglas, it's a matter of as utter indifference as it is whether his neighbor shall plant his farm with tobacco or stock it with horned cattle. Now, whether this view of Douglas's is right or wrong, it's very certain, Lincoln says, that the great mass of mankind take a totally different view.
they consider slavery a great moral wrong. So Lincoln is not only making clear his own view about the morality of slavery, but he's trying to isolate Douglas from the mainstream of political thought. He says, Douglas's view makes sense only if we assume that the Negro is not a man. And yet the Southerners themselves, he argues, treat the Negro as though he were a man. If that weren't the case, why would they object to the revival of the African slave trade? Why would they regard the slave trader in this country as a despicable character with whom they don't particularly want to associate? It must be that in their heart of hearts, they recognize that the Negro is a man. But now notice something. This moral position, grounded in the evil of slavery itself, would seem to lead naturally to a call for abolition. But Lincoln stops far short of that. In fact, when he was reviewing his alternatives, when he said he didn't know what to do, here's what he said about abolition. He said, what next? Free them and make them politically and socially our equals? My own feelings will not admit of this. And if mine would, we well know that those of the great mass of white people will not. Whether this feeling accords with justice and sound judgment is not the sole question, if indeed it's any part of it. A universal feeling, whether well or ill-founded, cannot be safely disregarded. So Lincoln denies that he's an abolitionist. And moreover, he says, even if he were an abolitionist, he couldn't in good conscience call for abolition because he knows that the mass of public opinion is against it. This is clear proof that Lincoln regards public opinion as a very strong constraint on what he can propose rhetorically. So he's taken a moral position that one might think leads him to abolitionism, but he stops short of that. He stops in the middle ground that's represented by the distinction between existing slavery and the extension of slavery. Now he takes Douglas's argument, and he says the argument for popular sovereignty would also justify reopening the slave trade from Africa, a position that Douglas, by the way, has opposed. He says if you've got a right to take your slave into Nebraska, you've got an equal right to buy your slave from Africa. It's equally their sacred right to buy them where they can buy them cheapest, and that undoubtedly will be on the coast of Africa. Now here's another case where he takes Douglas's position to its logical conclusion in order to argue against the position. Douglas, in his earlier speech, had spoken at length about the repeal of the Missouri Compromise, attempting to justify it. And here Lincoln has loads of fun. He develops with sarcasm that's pretty obvious, his response to Douglas's claim about the repeal of the Missouri Compromise. He said, wait a minute, Douglas himself championed the Missouri Compromise, and he quotes a whole series of speeches that Douglas made defending the Missouri Compromise. And then he says, now, I don't say this in order to point out that the judge is inconsistent. This is like, you know, if they say it's not about money, it's about money. I don't say this to point out that the judge is inconsistent. If he's gotten some new revelation, it's perfectly okay for him to change his mind. But, says Lincoln, I deny that public opinion demanded the repeal of the compromise, as Douglas had said. He said, I deny the public ever demanded any such thing. I deny it and call for the proof. Now, you know what sort of proof Douglas has, has offered. He said, well, in principle, in principle, the public demanded the repeal of the Missouri Compromise, and his evidence was the Wilmot Proviso controversy. He says, here are people who are arguing that slavery should be kept out of the territory acquired from Mexico. Well, that's a principle that takes priority over the principle of drawing a line. Lincoln says, come on. When I was voting in Congress to keep slavery out of New Mexico, you're now telling me that by that action I was voting to put it in, in Nebraska? 
And he proceeds to suggest that the Compromise of 1850 and the Kansas-Nebraska Act have nothing to do with one another, denying explicitly Douglas's claim that one superseded the other. And he does so by saying, look, these are two different pieces of land that they apply to. He said, referring to the 1850 Compromise, I insist this provision was made for Utah and New Mexico and for no other place whatever. It had no more direct reference to Nebraska than it had to the territories of the moon. And in this way, ridicules Douglas. He ridiculed him about the Wilmot Proviso controversy as well. And he ridicules him about the claim that, well, slavery won't go there anyway. A claim that Douglas was careful not to make in public, but which he privately believed. Lincoln says, this is a palliation a lullaby, suggesting that Douglas is making this argument to try to cause people not to be vigilant about the issue. He said, a glance at the map shows that there are five slave states, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, Kentucky, and Missouri, as well as the District of Columbia, north of the Missouri Compromise Line. It is not climate, then, that will keep slavery out of these territories. And then, finally, he argued that the repeal of the Missouri Compromise was unfair to the North. And he said, after all, this was a compromise. We gave up some things. We got some things. We gave up the possibility of keeping slavery out of territory south of the line. And now here's how he characterizes what went on. He says, after an angry and dangerous controversy, meaning the Missouri one, the parties made friends by dividing the bone of contention. The one party, meaning the South, first appropriates her own share and then seizes the share of the other party. It's as if two starving men had divided their only loaf. The one had hastily swallowed his half and then grabbed the other half just as the other one was putting it to its mouth. That's how Lincoln characterizes what the repeal of the Missouri Compromise represents. And he introduces the barest suggestion in this speech of an idea that he will develop later on that popular sovereignty is not really neutral, and that what Douglas secretly wants is to spread slavery into this area. He says, this declared indifference, but as I must think, covert real zeal for the spread of slavery, referring to Douglas's position, I cannot but hate. So you see what Lincoln has tried to do. He's tried to claim for himself the moral ground of arguing that slavery is wrong while rejecting where that ground would lead him to, which is abolition. At the same time, he refutes Douglas's popular sovereignty principle, not only by historical evidence and argument, but by showing that if you take that principle where it would logically lead, you result in absurdity. Now, this speech reflects Lincoln's own political calculation. For one thing, he's not very concerned about who his allies happen to be. One of the charges that was made against him as he began the campaign in the fall of 1854 is, yeah, there's got to be something wrong, Lincoln, if you're supporting the same positions that the abolitionists are supporting. And Lincoln, in this speech, pretty deftly brushes that charge aside. He says, some men, mostly Whigs, who condemn the repeal of the Missouri Compromise, nevertheless hesitate to go for its restoration, lest they be thrown in company with the abolitionists. Will they allow me, as an old Whig, to tell them good-humoredly that I think this is very silly? Stand with anybody that stands right. Stand with him while he is right, and part with him when he goes wrong. Stand with the abolitionist in restoring the Missouri Compromise. Stand against him when he attempts the repeal of the Fugitive Slave Law. So Lincoln is prepared to make an alliance that's pragmatic and expedient in order to bring about his objective, which is to restore the Missouri Compromise and to repeal the Kansas-Nebraska Act. He's very concerned with carving out a middle ground so that the position that he takes can be portrayed as 
a compromise position. And after referring to stand with the abolitionist and then part with the abolitionist, he says, in both cases, you expose the dangerous extremes. In both, you stand on the middle ground and you hold the ship level and steady. In both, you are national and nothing less than national. So he's trying to prepare his audience, you see, for a position that doesn't go to where the abolitionist goes, but is willing to ally with the abolitionists insofar as that's helpful to get Lincoln where he wants to go, and yet sharply distinguishes him from Douglas, who he's claiming professes to be indifferent, but in fact secretly has zeal to see slavery extended into these new territories. Now, to get a little extra bolstering for his position, Lincoln is smart enough to align his position with the giants of the old Whig party, Webster and Clay, and to suggest that he is standing exactly where they would have stood on the question. He says, Judge Douglas invokes against me the memory of Clay and of Webster. They were great men and men of great deeds, but where have I assailed them? I go against the repeal of the Missouri Compromise. Did they ever go for it? Now, this, by the way, is a cheap shot because both Webster and Clay had died before Douglas proposed the repeal of the Missouri Compromise. But he says, look, you know, these giants never supported Douglas, what you now support. He said, Clay and Webster were dead before this question arose. By what authority shall our senator say they would espouse his side of it if alive? Mr. Clay was the leading spirit in making the Missouri Compromise. Is it very credible that if now alive, he would take the lead in the breaking of it? And suggests, of course, that that would not be the case. And he goes on to say that what Douglas is trying to do is he's trying to peel off the support of some Whigs by deceptively invoking the memory of Webster and Clay. In fact, it's in this speech that Lincoln, referring to the ideals of Webster and Clay, makes one of his more memorable statements. He says, our Republican robe is soiled and trailed in the dust. By the way, when he said Republican, he meant with a little r. The Republican Party hadn't been formed yet. What he's suggesting is that the Kansas-Nebraska Act is a turning back on all of the Republican ideals that have guided the country until now. And this will be a key point that he'll develop later. But he says, our Republican robe is soiled and trailed in the dust. Let us repurify it. Let us turn and wash it white in the spirit, if not the blood, of the revolution. Biblical allusion is obvious here. Let us turn slavery from its claims of moral right back upon its existing legal rights and its arguments of necessity. Let us return it to the position our fathers gave it and there let it rest in peace. Let North and South, let all Americans, let all lovers of liberty everywhere join in this great and good work. Now notice again what Lincoln's doing. He didn't say let's all unite for abolition. He said let's all unite to put this issue back where the Founding Fathers had it. Now, that not only marks out his middle ground, but it identifies his position rather than Douglass's with the position of the Founding Fathers. So in the Peoria speech, which went on for over three hours, <coughs> Lincoln developed his political position, distinguishing between existing slavery and extending slavery, and opposing the Kansas-Nebraska Act. But he also revealed some of his key rhetorical methods, navigating the constraints of public opinion, drawing distinctions carefully, taking his opponent's positions to their logical conclusion in order to reduce them to absurdity, and using humor and sarcasm and wit, as well as the force of his argument, to draw his audience together in opposition to Douglas. The Peoria speech brought Lincoln back onto the national stage. In our next lecture, we'll explore Lincoln's thinking and writing on slavery from then until 1857.